not set for yourself the goal of becoming wealthy, famous, of reaching a specific position. Set for yourself the goal of becoming extraordinary in doing something, creating a lot of value before anybody else for yourself. But I'm talking about emotional value, happiness, satisfaction, enjoying what you do. Through the generation of that value, you're making your life enjoyable and worth living. I wanna highlight one of those things, which is about energy, like we're all energy, and energy has a frequency that when you love what you do and you act in service to others, you find your highest joy, you operate at a higher frequency. I'll, I'll do a keynote talk and people come up to me and they're like, I can feel your aura. I'm like, aura? I don't know. I don't, what are you talking about? I can feel your energy. You just radiate this positivity. And now I'm experiencing it with you. Do people say this to you? And how do you respond to that? Okay, the day has arrived, ladies and gentlemen. My next guest I met initially in Geneva backstage, and he had an air of confidence and importance about him, but I, did, I have to admit, I did not know who he was. And then luck or fate would have it that we would run into each other again in Pasadena of all places where we both spoke at the AIGA National Design Conference. And then for sure I know who this person is. And it's not that often that we get to speak to someone of his stature, of his influence, of his prominence. And as I go through your bio, I'm not even tell you who it is just yet. Let me just tell you his bio. And I don't even do this for a regular guests, but here we are. He's the senior vice president and chief design officer at a really large company. We'll get into that. He's won more than 1,800 design awards and innovation awards. That is incredible in itself. He was previously 3M's first chief design officer, featured in Fast Company's 50 most influential designers in America, Fortune's 40 under 40, and ad age list of the 50 world's most influential creative personalities. Oh my gosh, how do we do this? Mauro, please, for people who don't know who you are, please introduce yourself. Tell us what you do and tell us a little bit of your backstory. Well, first of all, you're too kind, Chris. <laughs> um, as you can hear from my accent, heavy accent, I'm Italian. <laughs> what accent are you talking my about? <laughs> <laughs> my name is Mauro Porcini. I'm the chief design officer of PepsiCo. I've been in this position for more than 11 years. I started in July 2012. Uh, I moved to the United States in 2010 to um, move to the headquarter of the company I was working for at that time, that is 3M. So tech company, Minnesota, and then I moved to the food and beverage industry, New York City, the magic New York City. Today, I'm an American citizen on top of mm. being an Italian citizen. I love America. I love Italy. I love what I'm doing. And, and I think this keyword, love, uh, is something that really defines my journey and what I'm trying to spread and preach and, and celebrate every day with my work, with my life. Mm. You know, it, it may be like this um, a stereotype of Italians, but you love life, you love culture, you love <laughs> food, and maybe this is a theme we get to explore. Now, as a kid growing up, I didn't even dream of being a designer professionally. It wasn't until much later on in my life, I'm like, oh, you could be a graphic designer. Never in a million years would I ever dream of playing a role in which you get to shape on a daily basis as chief design officer, vice, did I read this right? Was it vice president? Yes, vice, senior, senior vice, vice, vice president. Even senior vice president. <laughs> senior vice president. I mean, how did you even get this? How do you even get this kind of job? Like it's a dream on top of a dream. You know, Look, I love the way you shaped the question. Because like you, I didn't even dream to get this position and I didn't care about any kind of position like this. My dream was really, really different uh, and nothing to do with positions or um, uh, achievement of a certain status or wealth or, you know, any of this. I grew up in a family where there are three very important values. 
One was this idea of culture, of knowledge. My parents were celebrating people with culture, with knowledge. They were in awe of university professors, as an example, because they would spend their life researching on a specific topic and becoming the master of that topic. Uh, so that was one value. The second value was this idea of being a good person. Today, I, I call it being kind. In Italian, there is a very powerful word, essere una persona buona, to be a good person. Once again, in English, you will translate in that way. But in, it's very powerful, that word buono in Italian. And, and, and buono or kind are words that are not very fashionable right now. You're not be successful. You want to be an influencer. You want to be renowned. You want to arrive to positions like the one the two of us have in different ways, right? That, that's the goal. The goal is not to be kind. The, the goal is not anymore the one of being a person of culture, a very knowledgeable person, a person that knows things. Well, I grew up with those myths. My parents, again, were not celebrating when we were watching TV or we were encountering people, people that were rich or famous. They were celebrating people that that kind, that kind of culture. And I was just witnessing this by osmosis absorbing all of these. And for me, it was just normal when I was growing up. There was a third value, a third thing that I was observing. They loved so much what they were doing. My father is an architect, but he's not been a very successful architect. And he was spending all his free time painting. Art, painting, drawing was his passion. And he would do it all the time when I was a kid. And still today, I'm 48, he's in his 80s. Every day he paints, he sketches, he draws. My mother was working in finance. She didn't have a university degree. She didn't have the money, you know, to go to university. She went straight to work and she found a small career, a normal career in the world of finance. She hated it. She didn't like it at all. At 38, she left the work also to be very close to her kids. And, and it was a major sacrifice for our family because we didn't have a penny. So to lose that income was a sacrifice. But my mom wanted to stay closer to us children. But the other thing she wanted to do was to be close to the world of literature and philosophy. And I remember her writing every single day. And still today, she writes. And together, they've been publishing, self-publishing eight books that they don't sell i mean you can buy them but it's not their goal it's all about loving what they do and then sharing it with the people they care about so i grew up with those kind of values i wanted to get as much knowledge and culture and learn as much as possible i wanted to be a nice person but it was just a must you know it was not even a, a goal and i wanted somehow to do something i loved so there was not, you know, trade off on that. I wanted to do something I loved. And I realized now I couldn't really define that in that way, in this way at that time. But I realized now, now that somehow I wanted to touch the life of people with my creations. My dream back then was to become a writer because I love like my mom, literature and philosophy. So my myths were the poets and the writer and the philosopher from the past. And then the other dream was to become an artist. I wanted to be an artist. Drawing and writing were very coming very natural to me. Now, I also needed to get some income, some revenue, you know, to support myself in life because I don't come, once again, from a wealthy family. Uh, it was a miracle that I could go to university. I could go to university just because university in Italy, thank God, is free. So the best design mm. university in Italy is free, Polytechnico. And so... I decided to do architecture because it was a good compromise between the world of creativity and art on one side and the world of commerce in the other. I didn't have many chances in Italy to, become, to have a revenue and income by becoming an artist, a stable one, or by becoming a writer, an author of books. And so I chose architecture and, and just a few days before um, joining architect, doing the test for architecture, a friend of mine called me and told me, look, there is a new faculty within architecture called industrial design and I'm gonna try the test for it and you wanna join me so I was like, okay let's try I did it it went very well I got actually first out of thousands of people I was like okay maybe that's my destiny that's my career <laughs> I started with a leap of faith not having any idea what design really really was after a few months I realized that that university was a dream university they were going mm -hmm. to teach me what I always dream of 
creating something to create value for people, understanding people and creating solutions for them that could go in their hands and could improve the life of people in a way or the other, making it more fun, more enjoyable, more convenient, more easy, and so on and so forth. So all of these, and I'm sorry for the long, long answer. I promise I'm going to be shorter in the next one. (laughs) But, But to say, I think there is an important lesson here that I received from my parents by osmosis, literally, but that I want to really convey to my kids, you know, now I have one to Beatrice, to my daughter and to anybody, you know, interested to listening to us right now, do not set for yourself the goal of becoming wealthy, famous, of reaching a specific position, set for yourself the goal of becoming extraordinary in doing something creating a lot of value before anybody else for yourself. But I'm talking about emotional value, happiness, satisfaction, enjoying what you do. And then through that, you're creating value for somebody else. Through the generation of that value, you're making your life enjoyable and worth living. You are making, you are creating something valuable for society. And this is so important uh, in our world today. All of this will generate also everything else. Look, don't take me wrong. Wealth and fame, there's nothing bad on this, but they're just an addition to something else. If you miss the something else, the foundation, you're going you're gonna to be miserable with your money and with your fame. Okay. A lot to understand. I love what you're saying and how you shared your story. This is pretty wild for me. So your parents instilled in you some really core principles and then you realize in the real world where I still have to do something to make a living. And I think it's this balance between culture, the love for knowledge to instill within you, you got to do something that you're passionate about and you feel deep in your heart, but you're also smart enough like, okay, I, I still have to make a living here. And an architecture seems to be like a pretty like good balance between these two things. What allowed you to, have that idea and then switch in your mind. Like maybe I'll try and tell industrial design. It's like, that's a different area, Industrial right? design was even safer because it was new really? in Italy is the okay. very first faculty of design in Italy. So all these Italian designers, these famous Italian designers, they're all frustrated architects, fru- frustrated artists or frustrated <laughs> engineers. That, that's the joke that we always make in Italy. Before Polytechnico created the first official university of design uh, in 1993. And I yeah. joined in 1994. So it was safer because the, the word in Italian was disegno industriale, industrial design. Design was connected to the world of creativity and art. Industrial was giving me some reassurance that there was a connection to the industry, to commerce. And so look, but even that, both architecture and design, both of them were not that uh, um, expected choice for me. And I'll tell you something that happened. And once again, credit to my parents, I was doing very well at school in, in, in everything essentially. And my teachers, especially a teacher of literature, the teacher of philosophy, the teacher of mathematics separately went to my parents to tell them that they were wasting the life of their kid because they were allowing him to study design instead of sending me with my grades and, you know, my curriculum and everything to study business, engineering, manage, you know, one of the the things that you do when you do very well at school. And it was funny. My parents, you know, I think it was a mix of naivete on one side, but also, you know, believing in, in, in certain principle on the other. I think it's 50, 50. They just didn't care. They came home and they were laughing about that. And I was like, you know, actually they were almost offended by that. Um, but they were also <laughs> laughing and, and, but thank God they were there. Because if I had other parents that were more focused on doing what society expects you to do, on focusing on the fact that if you study business or if you study engineering, if you study certain things, if you have those grades, you may have a better career. You're going to have, you're going to make a lot of money. 
if they were relying on criteria that are more traditional in the world and in society, I would be somewhere else today. Maybe I would be a miserable finance person or engineer. And not say, I don't have anything against finance or engineer. I may be super happy doing those things. But, but I wouldn't have found something that for sure is giving me deep joy that is not a job. For me, it's a mission in life. It's something that I think of 24-7. For me, uh, to be a designer is who you are. It's not a job that you do. And that's why when we talk about people planning career path for myself and for the hundreds of designers that, that I have, you know, when I think about myself, I don't see myself in any other area that is not design. I, you know, I may at this point move to general management, marketing, maybe, you know, try to become the CEO of a company or things like this. But I will betray who I am inside that, you know, I am a designer at the core. Now I'm talking about big companies and everything. You never know. Maybe in 10 years time, I will be the CEO of my startup and we will <laughs> <laughs> listen to this podcast. I will be like, well, what the fuck was he saying? But anyway, <laughs> I'm joking. Never say never. But my point is that even if in the future, I, you know, I, I, I change trajectory Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to happen, but if it's going to happen, I'm going to be always a designer, you know, and yeah. I will find a way to delegate to others, other things. And that's why I think it's better. I just stay a designer and don't become a CEO or something else <laughs> because that's what I love to do. And that's what really gives me joy. And in life, the most important thing is to find your happiness. You know, we go after other things all the time in the illusion that they will give us some form of happiness satisfaction. And then you realize that there are, that happiness is driven by so many other variables, uh, that often we don't talk about. And, 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 and for me, the priority is to be happy, to have my family happy, my friends happy, my close, the people close to me, you know, I want them to be happy as well. Now, I want to say this for people who are listening to this podcast, and if you're not watching the YouTube video, we'll watch that when you get a chance. But I'm looking at Mara right now, and there is a kind of radiance from you, even in this pro uh, approximation of who you are in pixels and on a screen with phosphors, you can see he is smiling from, from ear to ear. Your skin seems to be glowing. I mean, you, you're just like radiating, radiating energy. Now, my wife who recently became a born again Christian is also getting into new age mysticism. She's constantly talking to me about all these new scientific discoveries. And I want to highlight one of those things, which is about energy. Like we're all energy and energy has a frequency and we vibrate and we send these things out there. Though we can't see it, it can be measured that when you love what you do and you act in service to others, you find your highest joy you operate at a higher frequency. And so people have said this to me and I'm like, oh, I don't know, but I'm going to ask you this exact question to see how you respond to it. I look at, I'll, I'll do a keynote talk and people come up to me and they're like, I could feel your aura. I'm like, aura, I don't, I don't know. What are you talking about? I could feel your energy. You just radiate this positivity. And now I'm experiencing it with you. Do people say this to you? And how do you respond to that? No, I, I, believe in this. I don't know how to define it. And actually I love the definition you just gave because it sounds pretty scientific as well. So <laughs> it, please send me any reference. I want to study more about this. I heard about this in the past, but mm -hmm. I never uh, dived into this, but I really believe in it. I really believe in it. And actually I was talking about this yesterday with my wife and my nanny because my daughter is like this. She's one year and four months old. And she's smiling all the time and she walks around and she's a cute baby, but you know, there are babies that are more beautiful and you know, but every time she walk anywhere in a restaurant or in a place, you know, and she meets people in an elevator, she look at them, she smiles to them. There is something people stop. And people react and they smile and they start to talk to her. And, and we realize that this is not happening with many other children we see around. 
And so, and one and two and three, at a certain point, you see a path, you see a consistency. And it was not me saying this. Somebody came to me and told me she has an energy. And, and that was interesting because it means that somehow there are certain things that start already with you in your DNA, you know, something that you have inside. I do believe that then you can also practice on that energy and amplify it even more. And even if you're not born with that energy to the extreme, you can increase that energy and have it. But for sure, there are some people that just have, have the frequency in them. And it's interesting because I think usually, and I may be wrong because I'm not an expert, but I think it's connected with enjoying what you do with, yeah. A real, authentic, transparent enjoyment of many things, of who you are, of what you do, of the people that surround you, of the experiences you're living, and 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 an optimism that you have inside, you know, as something that that the people can feel. The people they really, really feel this. But yeah, I really I really believe in in the power mm. of this energy, this aura. Mm -hmm. And for sure you Very have good. it. I mean, you, you, it's, <laughs> it's tangible. You, yeah, there are people enter a room and you just feel it even before they start to talk. It's body mm. language, it's the expression, it's, there is something there. Yeah. But again, you know, there are many people listening to us right now, Chris, right. they maybe are thinking, well, I don't have it. I was not born like this. I cannot. Well, again, there are people that are born like this, but practice training, starting with awareness, awareness about the power of that energy, awareness about how you amplify that energy in you, because we all have it in a way or the other, some degree of that energy, and then practicing it and trying to, you know, exponentially amplify this. I think even if you don't have it naturally, you can for sure increase it. And, and, and so, we can all get there in different ways with, you know, in different degrees, with a different kind of easiness. Um, but, but first of all, we need to be aware about the power of this energy and the power of joy and positivity and love. Yeah. I, I mean, people are going to sit there. What are these two hippies talking about? Like we're <laughs> so not hippies. Let's talk about numbers, data, data, data. <laughs> <laughs> like I run Because we can talk about that too, right? <laughs> yeah, we can, you know. And here you are, you know, senior vice president of a multinational corporation, a chief design officer. So we're, 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 we're going to balance this out, everybody, before you like, let's get the crystals out and burn some incense. Just, okay, we're just, you know, when people say, your energy is infectious without even knowing the principles behind this, their body already feels it. And, and here's what I believe when you, when you radiate a certain kind of frequency or energy, other people who resonate, like we're talking about frequency and sound and transmission of energy, when they resonate, a whole bunch of things happen because we're, we're constantly pulling each other. We either lift each other up or we can pull each other down. If you ever walked into a room where there's negative things happening, you're like, the expression they say is the tension was so thick, we can cut it with a knife. Like we feel it before we even understand like the physics behind it. And so when two people or a group of people resonate at a certain frequency, they're happier. And we know that there is a distinct advantage to positive psychology. When you're happier, you, you have more ideas, you can be more creative, you're more generous beautiful things that come from this. And I want to take it back to your parents. This, this, this person who tells you with your education, with your academics, you're a really bright guy. You could do anything. Why waste your talent on art and design? And, and your parents did something so beautiful. They're like, what? No, <laughs> we know what we need to do with our child. So they, they kind of protected you from that. And it's very consistent with this idea of being kind, loving, pursue knowledge, help other people. And then here you are at probably one of the highest positions that a creative person can achieve. And so we want to balance this that if you pursue money, if you pursue fame and impact and influence, very rarely do you get it in a way that your soul and your spirit can still be intact and whole. We've seen people like that. I don't want to get political. I don't want to talk about anybody in particular. But when you pursue your love, your joy, and you operate the highest frequency, I think naturally 
money, fame, influence, and impact just come as a byproduct of you operating at the highest frequency of your joy. Is that what's happening with you, Mara? Look, I think it happened. Obviously, obviously, I need I needed to balance a little bit what my parents were yeah. teaching me in full naivete <laughs> uh, with a better understanding of how network, navigate corporations, mm. understand the business world. I, you know, I want to make sure that we give the full message. So you need to be driven by certain principle that starts in your guts, in your heart and in your mind. But you shouldn't do it in a naive way. You shouldn't do it in a random way. Obviously, obviously, you need to know how to move in the business world, how to pitch an idea, how to, uh, you know, strategize to build your business, your capability, uh, to position yourself, your personal brand. Uh, so all of this obviously is part of that. If you're just positivity you enjoy what you do and you have a lot of fun doing that but you miss a series of other skills soft skills uh, then it's tough to arrive to a certain position now the important message though is that you may still be totally happy without being the senior vice president chief as an officer of a company just for clarity now if you also want to have that you need also certain skills to understand you know how to navigate that complexity but you can be totally happy being an artist having you know a normal totally normal life not having a team under you not doing a certain kind of work and it's perfectly fine and this is where my parents for me are an amazing example of this my mom left her job when she was 38 my dad was an architect as, as i say not very successful and because of that he, he was a teacher at school in high school of technical drawing as well he didn't really enjoy too much what he was doing at work and what he was really really enjoying was drawing and painting and everything now my mom and my dad in their humble life and what they were doing and everything they are the happiest person i know you know now I, I made some money i have some money so i told them mom dad what can i do for you i want to give you back also materially right and i remember right. a few years ago i told them look tell me anything anything i want to do something for you you did so much for right. me, you know, but I meant materially. It was the birthday of one of the two right. of them. So I told him, look, anything, li literally, even you want to buy a bigger house. I knew that my father, his dream was always the one of having a little garden. He always, always dreamed that. They live in a small yeah. apartment still today. I was like, I'm going to help you. They live in a town outside of Milan where apartments are really, really cheap <laughs> compared to New York, one tenth of the price of New York. So it was not that difficult to help them. And, and or a car, a better car. They have a shitty, shitty little car. And they were like, no, no, we don't want anything. I'm like, please, 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 please. You know what they asked me at the end? They could have asked me anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they asked me a trip to Lourdes. You know, the, where the Madonna appeared because they're super, super Catholic. Mm. Their dream mm. was, they never traveled, you know, and so their tree, dream was to go where there was, to Lourdes, where there was the apparition, there's been the apparition of uh, the Madonna. And, and the irony of life is that they went there at the end and the first day they were there, it was just a weekend, the first day they were there, somebody a very bad person stole their wallets. <laughs> and oh. so they were there without credit cards and documents or anything. So disaster, uh, irony of life. But I'm, I'm telling this story. I mean, this was the irony of, of the specific moment. But to say you can be happy becoming the CEO of a company, the CDO, the CMO, and or with your own startup and be very successful but you can be happy also without doing all of this. Now, to, all of, to do all of this, you need to understand how to navigate the complexity of the business world. My parents were happy with CDOs of anything. They are still happy without yeah. being CDOs of anything. Mm -hmm. Is there a happy ending to the story? To the travel no. story? <laughs> they, they lost everything, but they were over. No? No, they just went back. I was like... <laughs> You know, they, they traveled three <laughs> times in their life outside of Italy. Once was to go to Lourdes. Another time was to go to Prague 
but they, they were afraid to travel by plane. They traveled by bus. And unfortunately, when they came yeah. back after a few days, my father had a thrombosis <laughs> because he didn't move the legs too much and he risked his life. So that was really bad. Thank God it happened in front of me in my house. He came to meet me that morning so I, we could save him right away and take him to the hospital and urgent mm. care. And the third time went well. They came to the United States by miracle. So they're very, you know, the, one of the very first time they take a plane, they come all the way to New York yeah. and to see them here in New York, they were like, my mom, when she saw the Statue of Liberty, she started to cry, you know, literally like the emotion. Oh. So yeah, mm -hmm. they're such an inspiration in my life. I want to be a, <laughs> a glimpse of that for my daughter. Mm. I love that. So they've traveled three times, two of which had some really <laughs> bad outcomes, at least one time when they went to come visit you in New York, that a really good experience. Yes. I can only imagine what that's like for someone who hasn't traveled, who doesn't live in a big city. To, this is a culture shock on levels that it's hard to kind of, how did, how did they even process any of this? Uh, it's, I, it was beautiful to see their all, how mm. excited they were. And again, yeah. Now, you know, to change slightly topic, you know, we're talking about design, innovation, and that kind of awe and surprise is something that I see constantly in the innovators, no matter the experience you had in life. So in the case of my parents, yes, it was a first. They never saw buildings so high, you know, and something like this, like New York. But I met so many people in my life that had all kinds of experiences that have been traveling all around the world and they're still able to have that kind of awe and wonder that I saw in the face of my parents when they came to New York. And this is what innovators do. They still have that sensitivity, that empathy, that ability inside themselves to get excited by things, to discover always something new in things that eventually they already saw, to appreciate that, to have also the confidence of expressing this. How many people at a certain point in their life, when they reach a certain status or they want to project that they know everything, that they experience already everything. It's not cool to get excited about something. Oh, I did this so many times, you know, right. I have did. Or it's not cool to admit that you don't know something, that you are surprised by something, by something you see in nature, by something you see in a company, by something you see in experience with another person, by something you read in a book. But the real innovators, the confident leaders, they are not embarrassed by admitting that they don't know everything. Socrates already told us thousands mm. of years ago, you know, the wise men and women, I would add, are the people that know of not knowing. And, and the more you know, the more you learn, if you are really learning, if you are really getting the culture I was talking about earlier, the more you realize how much more there is to learn. You know, in my life, the more I was learning, the more, the more I started to feel little little in the universe, dust in the universe, because there is so much to learn and I don't have enough lives. You know, I, I have just one life. I would love to have thousands of lives to be able to learn everything that there is to learn. And, and it's so, you know, it's such a manifestation of essentially ignorance when you see people that pretend and project this idea that they know everything. And by the way, is the biggest limit you can put to yourself because the moment you stop learning, the moment you stop asking questions about things that you don't know, the moment you stop getting excited about things that surround you is the moment you stop growing. And our life should be a journey of continuous growth. Again, uh, you know, we are born raw energy or raw material. You know, in, in the book, when talking about life, I, 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 I make a metaphor. I talk about uh, Michelangelo, the artist Michelangelo, one of my myths when I was a kid. And at the end of his career, Michelangelo created the so-called unfinished, the non finiti in Italian, or they are also called the prisoners, i prigioni. Essentially, these are sculpture where he started with a piece of marble, the raw material, and then he started to chisel out the material 
freeing the shape that is in, in his mind was already inside the stone. His philosophy, was, and, and so he left the, the, the sculpture half done to convey this message. The message is that the sculpture is already inside the raw material, is already inside the marble. And the role of the uh, sculpture is the one of chiseling away material to free up the prisoners inside the marble. This is somehow our life. We are born potential. We are born raw material. And then we need to spend our life chiseling away material to define ourselves. We are sculptures of ourselves. And now we decide how to sculpt ourselves. Too many people, unfortunately, they refer to influencers, celebrities, role models of any kind, and they start to sculpt themselves in a similar way to these influencers and celebrities, mimicking them, trying to be them. This happens at every level. It can happen also at work, trying to be the person, you know, that your boss or somebody else that you admire. In reality, what we should do is, yes, you know, absorb as much as possible the energy and the learning and the lessons that we get from others of any kind. You don't need to be an influencer. You could be a mom or you could be a person you meet in the street. You can even, even be a kid that makes an unexpected question. Absorb, absorb, absorb. But then define your own sculpture. Define who you want to be. By the way, this is one of the three major steps to reach your happiness. You know, happiness as defined by many uh, uh, psychologists and human scientists is defined by three steps in life. The first one is defining yourself, is, is the search for your identity that is so strong, especially when we're younger. Because when we're younger, we're there and at a certain point, you know, we need to move from being the children of somebody to become real adults in life. And often we struggle and we try to figure out, you know, who we want to be. The job that you choose is a component, big component of this, but it's not the only one. You know, if, if your job defines you, you're screwed because you lose your job and you lose your identity. So is that plus other things. You need to be, you know, a person at 360 degrees. The second dimension to reach happiness, the second step is to invest in people close to you, to love people close to you, your family, your friends, your close, your close ones, including, by the way, colleagues that work very close to you. This applies also to the business world. This is very important. The love needs to be selfless. You don't do it to receive it back. But if you do love in a selfless way, people close to you, you will receive it back by definition, by, you know, from your parents, friends, and close ones. And you will enjoy, this will give you joy, that exchange. Then there is a third step, and often it comes later in life, and it's somehow part of our journey. For many of us, it comes later in life, for sure for me, and it is transcending yourself, finding a purpose that is bigger than you. And this can happen both in your private life as well as in your job. For instance, in, in my job, uh, there are two two kinds of purposes. One is the one of elevating as much as possible the role of design in corporations, not just in PepsiCo, in the business world. That's why I write books or I participate to podcasts, I have my own podcast and I do all these activities outside. The second is that design is by definition a human-centered kind of approach to business. Design is all about creating value for people, for society creating something meaningful to them. We're not here to make money for our companies. We're here, first of all, to create something cool to put in the hands of people, or if you want to, you know, in a more elegant way, to create something meaningful for people. And then, obviously, we need to make money with that. But it's a secondary goal, a necessary one, a super important one, but a secondary in our priority list. While for the business world, to make money is the primary goal and to create value for people is a lever. So it's a different philosophical approach to, to things. So if this is true, by elevating design, I'm going to elevate a conscience, a human centricity in all these companies because you will have these people, not just designers, but that kind of philosophy will spread across the organization in other functions to shape companies really with that kind of purpose, purposeful approach to branding, innovation, and business growth. So this is an example of purpose. Now, even this, it could be, you know, in your private life could be charity, could be activities that you do to help others. Even this that sounds so noble, so selfless, even this 
is all about you, is all about yourself. Why? Because at a certain point in life, you realize that sooner or later, you won't exist anymore. You will die. And so doing something bigger than you is a way to become immortal, to create a legacy, to be remembered after you're gone. You may be remembered because you did something in the world, because you're Steve Jobs and you created Apple and Pixar, or you may be remembered because you are a kind person and you are doing a lot of kind act to strangers, to different kinds of people, and people will remember you with a smile in their face. But this purpose that transcend yourself is giving you happy happiness now because you realize inside your guts that you are becoming mortal through the kind of love and, and kindness and purpose that is bigger than you. Mm. Okay, lots to unpack there. <laughs> Love it. Uh, I've been talking to Tamaro. He's a senior vice president and chief design officer at PepsiCo. His book, The Human Side of Innovation, The Power of People and Love with People is available on Amazon. We'll include the links in the description below. It's not often I get to talk to someone at your level and how many people you must have to oversee and manage. So I, I, I want to ask you this, this question, and I, I believe you're, you're prepared to, to, to answer this in that you, you've you been talking a lot about the power of design. I'm curious, what is the business metric that you're seeing when organizations, big and small, elevate, celebrate, and empower designers and design thinking into the organization? What is the benefit to them? If they're left-brainers, they're like, wait, you, you, you know, first you went down this hippie r r road to, to like joy and love and all this. And then you're talking about design. It's like, is there a tangible benefit, a metric that will impact businesses when you celebrate and incorporate design? It's very, very difficult to define a metric that measure what you're doing with design. First of all, we need to dis make a distinction between defining the ROI, if you want, of the design capability versus defining the ROI of how a company is design driven. Because to be really design driven is the role of every function of the company, from the CEO down, every single function. So you need marketing, finance, HR, all the functions to understand design centricity, or in other words, the synonym is human centricity. So if you understand that, that's the first point. The second is that the ultimate goal should be that you're growing financially your company. That's the truth because these companies are there to make money. So is, is top line growth, is bottom line growth, is market share, you know, all the typical financial variables. Now, for that though, it, that means that you cannot reduce design to, well, I change the aesthetic of a product. Let's see if I'm selling more products and are making more money with this redesign of the product. You cannot reduce everything to that because the real value of design is the impact that it's going to have on your business or on your brand in the long term. It's possible, take Pepsi, that I'm going to do a series of things that are more about the brand, limited edition packaging, experiences that are not going to generate right away and major return on investment, but are helping positioning the brand in a different way so that even the normal can of Pepsi that you find in Walmart or Target or wherever you buy it, is gonna be infused with that kind of experience and positioning that is driven by other things. So how do you measure that? It's very complicated. So the first thing is top line, bottom line growth plus market share are important, but you need to measure them depending on your industry in an industry like ours on a three years horizon. After three years of investing in design at 360 degrees, don't tell me, well, I'm going to change the product, but then I'm going to change the packaging later on. I'm going to change the experience later on. Imagine if Apple was having a beautiful phone, but the packaging was bad. The experience in store was bad. You can't measure the design of the phone if you don't do everything. Now, it's also true that in your company, eventually you cannot change everything from night to day, but you need to have a plan to change progressively 
as much as possible until arriving to change everything. And you need to be awareness as a business that until you do that, it's very difficult to measure the impact of design in the business because you need to have everything in place to really drive that change. So have a plan where you have a horizon to change the full ecosystem and then start to measure how your business is performing from when you change after, you know, you give yourself one year, two years, three years, depending on your business. It could be even more in industries where the change is heavy from an investment standpoint, life cycle standpoint, manufacturing standpoint. So it depends on the industry. So that's one thing. Now, it's not the only value you can bring. And it's very difficult, by the way, to demonstrate your value in this dimension because it takes years and companies are not the patient. They want to see value earlier. So when I was still in 3M, I defined a series of additional layers of value. The first one is, how, and they're all qualitative, even though you can measure them somehow, but it, I'll tell you at the end what happened in 3M and what is happening in PepsiCo with, this, with these layers. The first one is how you impact the users. And again, you can measure in different ways this, but is even, you know, very qualitative is the way people comment your product, react to your product in social media as an example, the conversation they're having. Uh, it, for instance, for Pepsi, it's the enthusiasm that people had when we launched the new design. I mean, 99% positive sentiment with 7 billion impression. Uh, that was like, wow, people really, really love what we're doing with this new design. But so first of all, how you are impacting people and you can again measure it, but you can also witness it. And I will tell you why this is valuable, even when you don't measure it. The second one is impact on customers. This has been very important for us, both at 3M and in PepsiCo in the past 11 years is essentially when I work with customers, customers being for us, I don't know, Walmart, Target, Kroger, Carrefour uh, in, in, in 3M was Home Depot and many others uh, is helping them redefining the experience that their guests have in their stores with not just our brands, but eventually our category beverages, food, do-it-yourself equipment, and, and, and other things. Becoming strategic partners of them, seeing how they see you, company, as a partner versus a supplier or versus, you know, and, and so you're going to create value for your company. Then is the impact on R&D on what you do from a research and development standpoint, is the number of ideas you bring to the table, the patent you bring to the table, is the, the idea that you are able to land and the idea you're gonna, and the, the success is you're gonna be able to generate through those ideas. Success is not being just eventually successful products, but it could be successful in size that then you, you leverage for other products and other ventures. Then is the impact on strategy, is how design thinking is helping you defining the strategic planning of the company. Where is the world going? Where is society going? Where is food and beverage going? And where PepsiCo should be in the future? Once the design starts to be a role in those conversations, start to have a role in those conversations, and you start to shape the strategic planning of the company, this is something very intangible. It's not something that you really see in the market, but it's something very powerful that design can do. And it's nothing else than business strategy, with human centricity because that's what design driven strategy is about then is impact on communication and employer brand brand essentially is how your company is perceived by different target audiences from shareholders media the new talents that will join the company in the future customers so a design driven company is often a company that is loved by people in so many different ways for different reasons. But obviously you need to craft different kinds of stories depending on the audience you're talking to. I'm gonna, it's gonna be a different story, the one that I tell a uh, potential talent to attract to PepsiCo than the one I'm gonna tell a shareholder. But they're all connected to the same philosophy approach to this idea of design-driven human centricity. And so these are, I will call them soft values. And then there is the very tangible value on cost of processes. You can decrease the cost of process by increasing the output, the quality of what you're doing. For instance, we have been tracking how much 
PepsiCo has been spending in design uh, between internal people and external agencies. And we have been generating savings of millions and millions of dollars over the years many millions of dollars. Uh, and we've been tracking this from the very beginning, 11 years of tracking. So now we have very substantial data. Uh, is the savings on cost of goods, you may decrease the cost of your product and increase perceived quality or keep the same cost. Uh, sorry, you can decrease the cost at the same perceived quality, or you can eventually keep the same cost or even increase the cost, but exponentially increase perceived quality, creating value for your business and your brand, and so on and so forth. So these are a few examples of things we've been on one side tracking, but the reality is that tracking all of this is intense. It requires money, resources, and often design functions don't have the luxury. And so what the way we're using it is not even tracking. I realized again, many years ago when I was still at 3M, that if you craft stories across all these points and you tell your CEO, you tell your business organization, well, we've been doing this in this project, in this project, creating value in all these dimensions for you, they will get it. Actually, they will start to see that by themselves because customers will talk to them, consumers will talk to them. So they will start to witness it by themselves. But then you craft the story, very powerful, showing all those dimensions of value. And they will be like, wow. And by the way, if you do that at the lower cost than just doing it randomly and consistently, just jumping from an agency to the other. But if you do it in, instead from within, strategically working with internal people and also with agencies, we work with tons of agencies out there. You, you, it's a super powerful proposition. That's why we keep growing. Uh, you know, we have more than 300 designers. We have 17 design centers. We just opened this week the design center in Istanbul because there is value on one side in a very productive way in the other is the magic formula of full effectiveness of what you're doing, quality and efficiency together. So you see, we jump from <laughs> love and emotion <laughs> to numbers and data. And this is what I was telling earlier. Probably my parents would have never been able to tell this kind of story, uh, the second part of the story. And that's why I'm saying, right. you know, yeah, you need the love, that authenticity that often you don't expect in this world, in these companies, in this kind of business environments. But if you just have that, you don't have the pragmatism, the ability to speak the language of business and, and translate the, actually, the financial value of love. That you, it's not the reason why you love, but because <laughs> we live in a world where financial value is such an important metric, if you can show that actually love creates value for your company, then it's amazing. Now, I wish we would live in a right. world where you don't need to connect love and kindness to productivity and financial value. But this is not the world we live in. And there are many good things, you know, in the way we structure this world we live in. So I don't want to be negative about the world we live in. Um, but, but again, it's magic that today you can connect creating value for people with creating value for companies. It was not the case 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Today is the case because many of those barriers to entry built by these big companies made of scale of production, distribution, and communication are crumbling down under the winds of globalization, new technologies, uh, digitization. So essentially, you know, many of these mega brands now don't compete anymore just amongst each other. They compete with a new startup that you are creating and you're bringing to market and Big and small are left with just one option, refocusing everything on people and creating something extraordinary for them. The best product, the best story, the best communication, the best experience, the best service, the best in everything. If you are weak in one of these dimensions, that's where competitor will come in. In the past, they wouldn't because they were, mm -hmm. there was this dynamic balance in your industry, few big players. Now you are a startup. That's what you look for. That, what is the weakness of the big brand? I'm going to go in and I, I don't have many of the constraints that they have. So I can actually go in and change the game. And so the small and the big, they need to refocus everything on what we have been calling today human centricity or design driven approach to business. The human being creates something valuable for them and everything else will come. Okay. I want to quickly recap a couple of like big ideas. 
And then I, I, before we run out of time, we're almost out of time here. I want to ask you this other question. So everybody hang in for that. So it seems to me part of your success, and correct me if I'm wrong, is your ability to navigate these two seemingly opposing ideas to be a passionate pragmatist. So we can dream, we can love, but it's got to make it's got to make an impact. There's got to be something. So it's not just purely in your mind and your heart. So for people who are like, I hate people who say, uh, just follow your dreams and follow your love. Well, you, you still have to be pragmatic and you have to create impact for people. And you gave us so many different ways. Some of the big ideas that you mentioned is design can have incredible impact but it has to be done holistically. It has to be done over the long term, and it's not going to happen overnight. You have to have a program or a strategy so that you're introducing progressive change as you go, and you you could you could feel it, you can measure it, you can capture sentiment, and and you talked about all those things because at the end of the day, if what you do doesn't create value for others, for users, for customers, for the planet, then you're probably failing. You need to reevaluate. Did I get? The general sentiment, okay? Totally, totally. And if you think about, you know, okay. especially the first part of your summary, yes, this is what humanity has been struggling all the time, is what philosophy, uh, art, literature have been uh, navigating in all our history, is the balance between our heart and our mind. When I was a kid, I tell this story in the book, there was this prophet, I would say, this kind of philosopher prophet that would come to our house. And one day we're having dinner with him and I was 16, 15. I, I just started to study philosophy at school. And, and he asked me, he asked the family, where the family around the table with this guy, he asked the family, what do you think is the biggest distance in the universe? It was a rhetorical question. He didn't expect anybody to answer. He was going to teach us a lesson. And here I am. I have this intuition that made me very proud in front of my parents, you know, in a family where currency was culture, <laughs> you know, being able to answer something like this to the prophet. It was like, <laughs> wow. Well, the answer was <laughs> the distance between your heart and your mind is the biggest distance in the universe. And Humanity has been trying to reconcile that distance all the time. Sometimes you have extreme extremists, people that are all about rationality and they're all about emotions and this polarize the conversation. But many of the people that have been making history are, been able, are people that have been able to take the two extreme and somehow find the balance between the two dimensions in unique ways, in meaningful ways, in ways that add value to them, to the people surrounding them and to society. Mm, I love that. Okay. This is a perspective I need to get from you before we wrap up here, which is you talk about the power of people and being in love with the people and, and trying to celebrate them. So you're in a position where you get to manage lots of people. How do you identify people's superpowers? Like this is a critical thing because I think we can learn whether you're about to hire your first employee or you're managing your 300th employee. How do you hire, grow, and retain the kinds of people who share the qualities that you're talking about? Let's divide hiring, growing, and retaining. On the hiring part, I have no clue. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know. I, 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 mean, I make so this. many mistakes. Yeah. I'm, you know, uh, but, uh, <laughs> and so because of this, and why? Because it's so difficult in one hour interview to, you know, with a portfolio yeah. and a resume and a conversation to understand if somebody has it or not. So many years ago, I, de I developed a strategy to fix that kind of problem. I decided to mm -hmm. share what I was looking for in many different ways. I started to write articles. I started to talk about these in conferences. Uh, I remember writing a paper for the Design Management Institute, the love letter to design. Later on, you know, more recently, I wrote a book about this, but the, the strategy is make it clear, super loud out there that that's the kind of people you're looking for. That's who you are, by the way, because if you are clear about the kind of people you look for, then you need to embody those characteristics and that push pushes even yourself to really invest time to take those kind of traits to the extreme, to become a role model. And it's not easy because, you know, we're talking about 
many different characteristics that define these ideal innovators, what they call the unicorns, and it's impossible to have them all to the extreme. So when you write them down and you're like, I want people like this, obviously you need to practice them yourself and try to get better and better, better every day. You will make a lot of mistakes, but with awareness and you will try to get better. So sharing this as much as possible out there through every kind of channel that you can imagine. For instance, today, Chris, I'm using your podcast to share this message with potential people that may want to uh, join the company. And then working, for instance, and other tactic, working with recruiters. We've been working with recruiters for many, many years now, uh, 15 years, some of them, 20 years, some of them. Uh, they know inside out who you are, what kind of people you're looking for. And their job is to be relationships with people out there, know them in depth. They have the time to do it. It's their core job. And so they bring to us people that reflect somehow the traits that, that, that I'm trying to, to find. So, and then another tactic, you know, just talk, being very practical, right? Because I know that I have my biases. I know I have my perspective like everybody else. I bring in, in the interviews, not with me, you know, I want to separate things. So everybody has a different kind of experience and conversation. People from my team or outside of my team with different perspectives. So they are going to see things that eventually I don't see. And then we get together and we debrief and we talk about what we saw. And often they, again, they see people, uh, things that I don't see. I see other things that they don't see. And we come back with a final evaluation of the person. And we try to choose the right people. And yet we, we don't always find the right one. To grow and retain, then once they are in, if they fit in the culture of the organization, it's all about inspiring them all the time. So you need to practice what you're talking about. You need to be what you're talking about. And then, so walk the talk. And then is empower them, let them free, give them the freedom to be themselves. And by the way, they're not gonna be like you, accept that. You want a certain kind of person, but then every person is different, accept that empower them and be there to steer their direction, to correct anything that you think is not going in the right direction. But if you empower them, they will enjoy what they do. They will become loyal to the dream, to the vision, to the company, and they will have fun doing it. How about retain? Well, I mean, it's a mix of that and then making sure that you pay them in the mm. right way. Uh, <laughs> and then I say pay because you reward them. You know, it will be broader than pay. Right. But pay, let's not be, you know, uh, let's be honest, is a key component. And why I'm mentioning this specifically? Because over the years, obviously, I had to work so much with our human resources team and, you know, the, the compensation team and everything to make sure that we're positioning design in the right way, that we had the right titles, the right compensation, that we are aligned to marketing, to R&D. It's not been easy. It's been a journey, by the way. You know, a, a, every other year we step it up, we, 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 we get better and better and better. But this is key. I mean, it would be hypocritical to just talk about vision and dream and this and that, and then they're not, they're paid, I don't know, half of a marketer or of a person working in R&D. Uh, so that's important as well. And by the way, I, I think it's interesting to also understand what is the role of a chief design officer. I mean, designing is a part of what I do, but I need to work with finance to justify the cost of our team, to define the ROI of the team. I need to talk with HR to understand the position inside the organization, the wiring with the rest of the organization, the right compensation for these people, the rewarding of these people, and so on and so forth. Actually, to be a chief design officer of a company means that you apply what you do with design to designing culture and capability. On top of it, you also need to design amazing products because you can design the best capability. But if you don't deliver on what is generating the revenue we were talking about earlier to the company, your job is not going to last. And by the way, just to close, we've been talking a lot, especially at the beginning about love and energy. And, you know, my, the subtitle of my book is people in love with people. And, and there is the introduction to the book of two CEOs of the company, Ramon Laguarta, the current CEO, and Indra Nui, the previous CEO. So two CEOs decided to put their name on the cover of my book, where the subtitle is The Power of People in Love with People. Very esoteric, right? I can talk in this way today because of the credibility I have now by delivering value, financial value. 
I was talking still about love. People that know me know this very well. When I started in, in PepsiCo 11 years ago, but in different ways. So that's another very important thing that I learned over the years. Uh, you know, you need always to balance. You need to disrupt a little bit with your vernacular, your vocabulary, the way you dress, the way uh, you behave, you know, disrupt, because that's what they want you to do. You are the designer, you are there to be creative, but you also need to integrate yourself within the culture of the company. You need, because in this way you reassure them. They understand that you understand them. They are not there to leverage you, but you are there to work with them to grow the organization. And so it's been always to find the right balance between disrupting, and integrating yourself. And, and so the more you integrate yourself, the more they understand that you are actually delivering business value, the more you can start to disrupt and use certain kind of words and, and tell them, you know what, everything we've been doing, delivering this kind of business value was actually driven by love, by kindness, by things like this. But if I was starting talking about this without having proof points, a lot of people would roll their eyes and be like, whatever, I mean, Let's not waste time listening right. to this guy. Beautiful. I could sit here and listen to you talk all day. It could be everything that you're saying resonates with my soul. It could be your beautiful Italian accent, but I want to be respectful of your time. Everybody, I've been talking to Mara Porcini. He's the senior vice president and chief design officer at PepsiCo. His book is out now. You can go and pick it up right now. You can order on Amazon or your favorite bookstore. It's called The Human Side of Innovation, The Power of People in Love with People. Now, I love where we started, so I'm going to just try to like bookend all of this. What I really feel from you is this deep, love, passion, and joy for whatever it is that you're doing. So today you're within an organization. We shall see in 10 years if you're not the CEO of some startup, who knows what's going on. I predict some big changes to happen for you, but it's okay because we're allowed to realign with where we are. We're not static beings. We continue to grow and we should align with that, what gives us joy. And it's okay for you to love, but it's it's better for you also to be a good person, to be kind, to share your gifts. And you talked about the kinds of impact that drives your thinking, your decisions, and also the love for knowledge, for learning. Because the more you know, the more you know you don't know. And if we pursue these three core pillars, I, I think even if you're not rich, just like your parents, you live a happy, joyous life. And what more could you ask for in the short time that we have? Mauro, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for doing this podcast with me. Chris, thank you for having me. And thanks for everybody that's been listening and watching us.